The House Resources Committee held a hearing Wednesday on energy resources in Alaska. Administration and Alaska state officials testified for about two and a half hours. The committee will come to order. The committee is meeting today to hear testimony on H.R. 39, the Arctic Coastal Plain Domestic Energy Security Act of 2003. Sponsored by the laid back former chairman of this committee and someone I consider a personal friend, Don Young of Alaska. Under committee rule 4G, the chairman and the ranking minority member will make opening statements. If any other members have statements, they can be included in the hearing record under unanimous consent. With a few exceptions, H.R. 39 is identical to what was passed in the House in the 107th Congress as part of the Comprehensive Energy Bill. The Senate version of the Energy Bill did not contain a provision opening ANWR, and a conference committee failed to reconcile the two bills. H.R. 39 authorizes environmentally sound oil and gas exploration, development, and production on the one and a half million acre coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, an area specifically reserved by Congress for its oil and gas potential. Under this bill, the rest of ANWR itself will remain untouched. We're holding a hearing on H.R. 39 because ANWR again will be a co cornerstone of the House's comprehensive energy bill. Many of you must be wondering why there has been continuing interest in ANWR for the last 25 years. What is so special about this flat, treeless Arctic desert? ANWR's coastal plain is potentially the largest undiscovered onshore oil field in North America. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that there are 5.7 to 16 billion barrels of recoverable oil there, with a mean of 10.4 billion barrels. Putting this in perspective, 10.4 billion barrels is twice as much as all proven reserves in the state of Texas. It could increase America's reserves by 50 percent. It could be one of the world's largest discoveries of oil in the last 30 years. As America's dependence on foreign oil approaches 60 percent, it is foolish not to look for oil in a place that could hold resources of this magnitude, especially at a time when a substantial amount of this foreign oil is imported from hostile governments. It defies common sense to buy oil from a dictator who can convert American dollars into weapons of mass destruction that will be used against the American people. While opening ANWR may not end dependence on foreign oil, it can substantially reduce it. For example, it could replace all Iraqi imports, imports for the next several decades. It can lower our trade deficit, which has an impact on interest rates, the federal budget, and economic growth. Oil development in ANWR is locally supported, as we will hear directly from our witnesses today. Over the past several years, the federal government has closed off some of the most promising areas from oil and gas exploration on the grounds that such activities lack local support. If this is the government's criteria for oil exploration, then there should be no argument over ANWR. Unfortunately, I've observed that some of the most aggressive opponents of ANWR are the ones who have declined invitations to the North Slope to view firsthand exactly what they're talking about. Anyone who visits Alaska will immediately see that under the state and local government's rigorous environmental rules, wildlife and their habitat have peacefully coexisted with the production of 14 billion barrels of oil for American consumers. For example, the caribou herd using the Prudhoe Bay oil fields has grown from 5,000 to 32,000 since development began a quarter century ago. The fact is, no wildlife species population has been adversely affected by Alaska oil development. But don't just take my word for this. There's, this is the finding in a recent study of the Argonne National Laboratory. This record can and will be re replicated in ANWR. I previously mentioned that it defies common sense to buy oil from our enemies. It also defies logic to purchase oil from nations having little or no regard for environmental protection. Developing resources and creating jobs here in the U.S. under the world's most stringent environmental standards contributes to a cleaner, healthier environment around the world. I've been to Alaska's North Slope, and I challenge anyone to tell me where else 14 billion barrels can be 
can be produced with so little disturbance. Alaskans treasure their wildlife and their environment as much as we treasure ours. The views of the people who live in Alaska's Arctic coastal plain should be this committee's highest consideration. They have the most at stake in this debate because they depend on the land for their virtual survival. They want to contribute to America's energy security by tapping into Anwar's world-class energy resources. What better to judge whether or not oil exploration can be done safely and properly. Our witnesses today represent a broad spectrum of views on ANWR, and I look forward to hearing testimony on Mr. Young's bill. I now recognize the ranking member er, in his stead, Mr. Markey, for his opening statement. Uh, I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. In our lifetimes, we have few opportunities to shape the very earth on which our descendants will live their lives. So said Mo Udall 23 years ago, as the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act neared passage. Mo Udall was a visionary, as was President Eisenhower, and as has been many other great American leaders in focusing upon the need to preserve this great space. We are here to discuss H.R. 39, the Arctic Coastal Plain Domestic Energy Security Act of 2003. This bill would overturn the 23-year congressional precedent of protecting the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from oil development. Before we take that drastic step, I believe this committee deserves to debate the full range of policy options for this precious part of America. Unfortunately, we are not having that debate today. I have requested a hearing on H.R. 770, the Morris K. Udall Arctic Wilderness Act of 2003, which would designate the coastal plain as wilderness and permanently protect it from development because permanent protection is an equally valid policy option for this committee to consider. But the closest we will come to a full debate today is holding this hearing in the Morris K. Udall room. The panels are also missing an important voice, that of the Gwich'in people, whose culture and lives are intimately tied to the porcupine caribou that rely on the Arctic's refuge coastal plain for calving. Lucy Beach, a member of the Gwich'in Steering Committee, joins us in the audience today, and I would ask unanimous consent that a statement from the Gwich'in Steering Committee be included in the record. To quote from their statement, as Gwich'in, this is a human rights issue. We have relied on the caribou for thousands of years, and the caribou continues to be a critical element in our culture. Proponents of this bill have told you why they think we should open the refuge for development. Let me tell you why I think the Arctic refuge should remain wild. The wilderness is unparalleled. Nowhere on Earth is the diversity of Arctic habitat and wildlife represented as it is in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. According to the Fish and Wildlife Service, this relative compactness of habitats provides for a greater degree of ecological diversity than any other similarly sized area in Alaska's North Slope. Industry isn't interested in drilling there. According to media reports, British Petroleum, the major North Slope player, is looking elsewhere in the world for the next big field and is even considering shutting down the Badami field, the field closest to the Arctic refuge. Looking in the refuge is the wrong place to find energy security. Developing the Arctic refuge will not make us independent of foreign oil sources. To become energy independent, we should ta tap American ingenuity to make more efficient buildings and vehicles and to design new renewable technologies that our domestic resources can fuel cleanly. And we don't need Arctic refuge oil to replace Iraqi oil. From 1991 to 1995, Oil imports from Iraq were banned. Oil prices and supplies barely hiccuped, and the period coincided with one of the greatest economic expansions in United States history. And damaging uh, a precedent would also be set by allowing the oil and gas development in the Arctic refuge. This would overturn a 35-year history of refuge protection dating back to 1966, the National Wildlife Refuge System Administration Act. Nearly 300 refuges in 44 states would be threatened by this precedent. 
Ignoring recent National Academy's findings that oil development has caused wildlife and their habitats harm, we are considering a bill that finds oil exploration and development compatible with the mission of the refuge, that relies on an environmental impact statement from 1987, and that doesn't allow the Secretary of Interior to consider a no leasing alternative. Faced with reclamation liabilities that the General Accounting Office estimates could be as high as $6 billion for the current state of development, we are considering allowing the oil industry to invade this only portion, less than, into the only portion, less than 5 percent of the North Slope that is currently off limits. When will we realize that the road to energy independence will never run through the Arctic refuge? Rational energy policy will begin the day that Congress drops any idea of turning the refuge into a filling station and instead grants this extraordinary area the full Wilderness Act protection it deserves. The American people sense in their bones that the value of the Arctic refuge should never be measured in barrels of oil, our employee work days, or drops in the federal deficit bucket. They consider it priceless, one of a kind, a national environmental treasure that should not be sacrificed by this Congress or this committee, not now, not ever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And with unanimous consent, the statement will be included in the record at the appropriate place. All members' opening statements will be included at the appropriate place. I'd like to Welcome our first panel. I'd like to welcome our first panel, the Secretary of Interior, Gail Norton. It is the intention of the Chairman to place all witnesses under oath. This is a formality of the committee that is meant to assure open and honest discussion and should not affect the testimony given by witnesses. I believe all of the witnesses were informed of this before appearing here today, and they have each been provided of a copy of the committee rules. Now, if you please, would you stand and raise your right hand, and I will administer the oath. You solemnly swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that responses given and statements made will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Let the record show she responded in the affirmative. I'd like to welcome the Secretary here today. We're all anticipating and look forward to your testimony. If you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today and to talk about the proposal for energy exploration in the 1002 area of Alaska's North Slope. As you know, this administration firmly believes that we can develop energy at home while protecting the environmental values that we all hold dear. ANWR is the largest untapped source of onshore oil. We can compare it to other places in the United States in order to gain a perspective of how significant it is. And that is what I will do in today's testimony, as well as discuss the environmental protections that are necessary for any legislation. With your indulgence, I'd like to begin by breaking a Washington rule. The rule says never credit the rhetoric of the opposing side by repeating it. Well, I intend to do exactly that. My goal is to show that rhetoric is no substitute for the facts. Please watch this advertisement, which ran on national television and is now on the Internet. Almost nothing in this video is representative of the coastal plain of Anwar. We call it the coastal plain because it is just that, a plain. There are no trees. There are no deep water lakes. There are no mountains like those in the video. Outside the area affected by H.R. 39, there are mountains in Anwar but they are designated as wilderness areas, and no one is remotely considering them for energy production. Only the polar bear photo could have been taken anywhere on the coastal plain. Now, in each of your packets is a photo of what Anwar actually looks like most of the year. Now, I apologize that um, we're, it'll take us a minute to uh, have a video showing what Anwar actually looks like. But I visited there two years ago on the last day of March. 
There's a wind chill factor of 75 degrees below zero. It is an area of flat white nothingness. There are no features beyond the flatness. There are even 56 days of total darkness during the year and almost nine months of harsh winter. And this is actually the, the area that you would see if you were there. This is, is what the coastal plain looks like. Rhetoric such as that in the advertisement may bring in contributions, sway people with emotionalism, and it rarely bothers with all of the facts. The differences are stark in these two presentations. I intend this morning to take you through the proposed legislation and to discuss some of the conclusions in the recent study by the National Academy of Sciences. I intend to uncover the facts for you as clearly and as graphically as time and our audiovisual technology permit. The state of Alaska is too often portrayed on maps as an inset along with Hawaii, and so people rarely understand the massive scale of Alaska. This is the size of Alaska if it were superimposed on the lower 48 states. As you look at the enormity of the state, keep in mind that it has vast areas that are in conservation areas. There are wilderness areas, parks, and other conservation areas totaling almost 140 million acres. They are already protected. That is an area larger than the states of California and New York put together. And those are areas that are off limit for energy development or any other kind of development activity. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is located at the frozen north end of the state on the Beaufort Sea. This 19 and a half million acre refuge includes 8 million acres that is congressionally designated wilderness. The refuge itself is about the size of South Carolina. In 1980, Section 1002 of the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, President Carter and the Congress set aside one and a half million acres of the coastal plain for potential exploration and development, the 1002 area. They did so because of initial indications of the area's energy potential. This makes this area unique. This is not precedent for any other area of the refuge system. This is the only area that has a long-standing designation for this type of energy development. That potential has since been reinforced by additional study. Only the 1002 area is under consideration for, research develop for resource development in any proposals before the Congress. A constant refrain by those opposed to oil development in Anwar is that it contains only a short-term speculative supply of oil. The coastal plain is this nation's single greatest onshore prospect for future oil. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that it contains a mean expected value of 10.4 billion barrels of technically recoverable oil. At the low end, there's a 95% probability that it will contain at least 5.7 billion barrels. At the high end, there is a 5% probability that it may contain 16 billion barrels. Well, let me put that in context for you. This is a slide that you have never seen before. This provides some new information. The potential daily production from the 1002 area alone is larger than the current daily onshore production of any lower 48 state. The estimated daily production from Anwar would exceed what is now being produced in any individual state, including Texas and Louisiana. The bar to the furthest left is what the Department of Energy estimates would come from Anwar. And this is from a March 2000 study by the Department of Energy. Uh, the production from uh, the other states is the current production. So the the ANWR bar deals with future production. The other states are their current production. But as you can see, ANWR exceeds any of those other states. And it, we've excluded uh, everything but the lower 48. In 1968, Prudhoe Bay was estimated to hold 9 billion barrels of oil. Today, its production is at 13 billion barrels, and it's still producing. If we look at the mean calculation of 10.4 billion barrels of oil, and we applied that to just one state at a time, so if everything produced in Anwar went to one state, 
It would supply every drop of petroleum for the entire state of Arkansas for 144 years, or Missouri for 71 years, or South Dakota for 479 years. Well, all in all, as we can see, it is a very significant amount of oil that could be developed. We've now heard for more than 15 years that it is not worth developing on the coastal plain because it would take 10 years to get, to the, oil, to get the oil to market. If, we'd be, if we had begun exploration and development when the Congress first proposed it, coastal plain oil would be in the Trans-Alaska Pipeline today. This country is heavily reliant on oil for the North, from the North Slope. We've already produced far more than half of the oil available at Prudhoe Bay. As a result, North Slope oil production is declining. Any oil well, once it begins production, gradually declines as the oil is extracted. Our imports and our consumption are going up. And this slide shows the national trends in energy consumption. Uh, as you can see, our consumption rises that's the top line in the chart. The green and blue lines show our production. As you can see, America's production has gradually been declining. That's the green line. We take the place of that uh, decline in production by increasing our amount of imports. That is the blue line. The green lines and blue lines have intersected did so in the early 1990s. We are now importing more than we produce. In addition, in some cases, our foreign source, sources of oil are becoming more and more unstable. This slide again shows ANWR and the Department of Energy's same estimates of daily production. And this is in comparison to other states, or excuse me, other countries from which the United States imports its oil. Oil from the 1002 area could reduce our dependence on those foreign sources. Last December, strikers nearly shut down Venezuela's oil industry, drastically reducing the production of Venezuelan oil and its delivery to external markets. In the last several years, Venezuela ranked consistently as one of the four top sources of U.S. oil imports. In 2002, Venezuelan exports to the United States were only slightly more than what we could see, or were about the same as what we could see from the 1002 area. Venezuelan exports are still recovering from the strike. It could be months before that country resumes pumping at its earlier levels. Our reliance on foreign oil has impacts on the lives of American families, farmers, and workers, as the cur current gasoline price increases have shown. As long as we have planes, trains, and automobiles powered by oil and gas, we will need a homegrown, stable, reliable source of supply. In addition to its energy potential, oil from the 1002 area could be a new source of needed federal revenues. The administration's fiscal year 2004 budget proposes to dedicate the federal share of the first lease sale bonus bids, estimated to be $1.2 billion, to the Department of Energy to fund increased renewable energy technology research and development over seven years. The administration's proposal provides for a 50-50 split of future coastal plain revenues between the state of Alaska and the federal treasury. Now let me turn to some of the questions about the environmental impacts of development in ANWR. There are those who have raised concerns that one need merely look at the Prudhoe Bay oil fields to see what will happen in ANWR's coastal plain. The National Academy of Sciences report issued last week, plus H.R. 39's provisions, can actually help us look into the future. H.R. 39 includes language that would require the Department of the Interior to develop the most stringently regulated oil and gas leasing program in the United States. The administration views tough regulation as an essential part of the ANWR proposal. Because ANWR's reserves are so concentrated, we can require much more expensive technology than would be feasible anywhere else. We can test American ingenuity and technology to develop ways to meet these strict standards and remain competitive. There is much concern that opening the coastal plain will mean a proliferation of roads and off-road seismic trails directly affecting the tundra, altering animal habitat and behavior, and increasing access for hunters and tourists. 
The legislation before you, H.R. 39, specifically prohibits development of that kind of infrastructure. For example, older 2D seismic on the coastal plain has been cited as a major impact to the tundra. This photograph, which was in the New York Times yesterday, was taken one year after seismic testing in 1984. Today, trails are still, are still visible from the air. The National Academy of Sciences points out the effect of older seismic tests that are mainly visual and remain in only a small percentage of the disturbed areas. We have learned much from the seismic work done in the 1980s about how to protect the tundra from this kind of damage. As the New York Times reported, newer 3D seismic techniques have much less impact on the tundra than the old 2D seismic. Current practices now replace gravel roads with ice roads as a means of access to isolated drilling locations. I visited Anwar in the winter and saw, as this, this slide shows, the ice roads in use during the winter. I also visited again in the summer and saw that those roads had melted away and there was not a, a remnant of those roads still left. This slide shows an exploration drill site developed using new technology. There's little evidence of seismic trails, ice roads, or ice pads once the snow cover is gone. And this is what the effects would look like for exploration drilling. The use of low ground pressure vehicles called rollagons addresses potential problems associated with exploration drilling in areas with limited fresh water supply or sh shortened ice road seasons. There are also new Arctic drilling platforms that are similar to offshore platforms that are being developed. They could reduce or eliminate altogether the need for ice roads or ice pads. This is especially useful in areas with limited freshwater supply. These elevated platforms are often referred to as Lego pads because of their similarity to the toys. Uh, the bill you are considering today requires the application of the best commercially available technology for oil and gas exploration, drilling, and production. New technology offers ways of developing and producing oil without the web of roads now found on the North Slope. Uh, this chart shows the greater reach of horizontal wells, the ways that new technology can allow us to reach further underground with less impact on the surface. In 1970, the average drill site was 65 acres, and it covered a subsurface area of about three square miles. Today, a drill pad built in 2000 is only 13 acres. It allows companies to reach more than 50 square miles of subsurface. New technology allows extraction of oil from larger areas underground, reducing the number of pads needed to develop an oil field. Because the fields use more effective drilling and fewer wells, waste, mud, and cuttings uh, are, are produced. Because fuel consumption is lower, there are fewer emissions. One group in its campaign against opening Anwar states, quote, spillage from 20 years of oil extraction has substantially degraded habitat on the North Slope, close quote. However, the National Academy of Sciences found that despite initial widespread concerns about spills, most spills have been small and have had only limited effects. Large, nation, or large magnitude spills have generally been avoided on the North Slope because of the system of monitoring and check valves on all pipelines. The National Academy of Sciences found that to date, the effects of contaminant spills have not accumulated on North Slope vegetation. Almost every group opposed to ANWR development cites concerns about air quality on the North Slope. However, the National Academy of Sciences report found that local air quality does not appear to have been seriously degraded by emissions from oil and gas production facilities. We often see pictures of polar bears in appeals for funds to save the Arctic refuge. One organization begins its plea with a statement that developments, quote, could force polar bears to abandon their maternity dens, which they dig in the snowdrifts, and leave their cubs to die." Close quote. This comes from a 1985 report of one polar bear leaving its den as a result of older seismic activity. In fact, North Slope development, which is far more intense than any potential coastal plain development, has had no devastating effect on polar bears. Polar bears have thrived since 1967. 
The NAS report found there have been no known cases where polar bears have been affected by oil spilled as a result of North Slope industrial activities. The National Academy of Sciences sums up its polar bear discussion by stating there is evidence to support a finding that there have been no serious effects or accumulation of effects on polar bears. A number of environmental groups express concern about the well-being of musk oxen. These animals once were exterminated by excessive hunting. They have been reintroduced on the North Slope. They are found at low densities, mostly in riparian areas. Their populations are now expanding into other habitats. To date, there have been no cumulative impacts on musk oxen from oil activities. A U.S. Geological Survey report suggests a solution. Avoidance by industry of areas used by musk oxen and the location of permanent facilities away from river corridors, floodplains, and adjacent uplands could reduce the probability of dis disturbance and displacement of musk oxen. For all activities in the 1002 area, H.R. 39 generally requires avoidance of streams and river systems, wetlands, and riparian habitats. Facilities must minimize impacts on sen sensitive fish and wildlife habitats and species. The caribou are the best known wildlife in Anwar. There are those who have tried to convince you that they will be irreparably harmed if we have any development on the coastal plain. Before I turn to an effect of actual if before I turn to a discussion of actual effects on caribou, I'd like you to remember the environmental standard in the bill before us. H.R. 39 requires Interior to ensure that all oil and gas exploration, development, and production activities on the coastal plain will result in no significant adverse effect on fish and wildlife and their habitat. This standard is reiterated numerous times throughout H.R. 39. The central Arctic herd is the caribou herd in the North Slope. It includes the Prudhoe Bay oil fields in its range. The numbers in this herd have increased from 5,000 in 1977 at the begin of, beginning of oil development to 27,000 in 2000. The Alaska Fish and Game has published the most recent census. It shows that the population is now more than 31,000. Anwar's herd is the porcupine caribou herd. The calving grounds for their area um, are those that are most frequently discussed. It's important to keep in mind where the greatest potential for oil development is on the coastal plain. The USGS scientists predict that 83% 80 per of the oil potential is on the far western side of the 1002 area. And this slide, uh, the the gray area in this slide is the area that USGS believes will have the most oil potential. It's the area that is closest to the existing infrastructure, to Prudhoe Bay, and to the northern end of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. This is the area least likely to see high concentrations of calving. In fact, a U.S. Geological Survey study found that under the most realistic scenario for developing the 1002 area, there would be a 95% chance of having no impact on calf survival. It's also important to remember that there are years when the porcupine caribou herd does not even use Anwar's coastal plain at all for calving. In fact, in 2000, 2001, and 2002, the caribou herd calved entirely outside the 1002 area. Increased domestic oil production means increased jobs for Americans. The innovations in Arctic frontier technology continue to create jobs. Organizations that represent many of the workers in this nation have pointed out that by tapping into petroleum resources in Alaska, we can create jobs and benefit our economy by lessening our dependence on foreign oil. Although estimates of job creation vary, it is safe to say a large number of new jobs for Americans will directly and indirectly result from the exploration, development, and production on the coastal plain. The coastal plain is the single greatest prospect for onshore oil and gas development of any place in the United States. This slide is a very important one in terms of understanding the significance of ANWR. Uh, the regions that are shown in this map are ones that the U.S. Geological Survey has used for decades. They're based on the geologic um, divisions of areas in the United States. To equal ANWR's potential of from 5.7 to 16 billion barrels of oil, 
we would have to explore and develop all potential fields in regions two, three, and four on this map, nearly half of the contiguous states. Uh, the, uh, go back. Uh, on this map, what you can see is essentially to scale. Uh, in the, the lower left-hand corner, you see the refuge itself um, as it would be to scale. And the yellow part at the top of that is the 1002 area. Uh, there is more undiscovered con conventional oil resource in that small area than any of those other regions in the United States. And that is why we are focusing on ANWR. Neither this administration nor the Interior Department arbitrarily picked the coastal plain. The coastal plain is the single greatest prospect for development onshore in our nation. Legislators back in 1980 realized that fact when they created the 1002 area. Legislators today are looking at an ANWR bill that includes the strongest environmental protections ever required in an oil and gas leasing, leasing regime. We have all learned from the past we now see the most environmentally protective development in the world at the newest sites on the North Slope. We will improve on that record. As we consider whether to look to ANWR for America's future energy sources, we should also consider the international effects on the environment. Uh, certainly, our protections that would be imposed at ANWR are far in excess of any of the other places where American oil would come from to meet America's needs. If you look at the standards in other countries where oil companies might be looking to provide America's supply, they are far less stringent than what America would, Im would impose in ANWR. The legislation doesn't ask developers to use new technology. The proposal demands the best available technology. This chart shows how drill pads have shrunk since Prudhoe Bay was originally developed. Development today would have to start with the smallest. H.R. 39 doesn't just ask that equipment be removed and that the land be restored. It demands that whatever is taken in must be taken out and that the land must be restored to its previous use for wildlife. The problems identified by the National Academy of Sciences report were problems mainly related to lands regulated by the state of Alaska and subject to Alaskan law. Both the National Petroleum Reserve and any future ANWR development would be governed by federal statute and federal enforcement. H.R. 39 doesn't just ask that wildlife be protected. It demands that developers protect wildlife or we will shut them down. If exploration interferes with migration or calving, we will shut it down. It took courage back in 1973 for a Democratic majority Congress to cast a vote in favor of building a pipeline to Alaska. At that time, the debate was similar in character to the ANWR debate taking place today. But the Senate put national energy security ahead of everything else and in a 50-50 vote, with the vice president breaking the tie, the historic pipeline was approved. Senator Walter Mondale has been quoted as saying at that time, quote, it has always been my position that we need Alaskan oil and that this oil should flow to the lower 48 as soon as possible, consistent with environmental safeguards and the greatest benefit for the entire, entire country, close quote. That pipeline has carried as much as 2 million barrels a day from Prudhoe Bay. For 20 years, it has provided as much as 20% of our domestic production. This is a 2020 vision that we need to repeat, consistent with environmental safeguards. 21st century technology improves our ability to protect the environment. Partisanship should once again be put aside for energy security. I ask the committee and the entire Congress to please examine the facts as the National Academy of Sciences did and discount the rhetoric of partisanship. This decision is too important for America's future. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary, is very informative testimony. In March of 2002, USGS released a expanded economic analysis of Anwar oil resources that said 
that at market price of $21 a barrel, 6 billion barrels of oil were economically recoverable from the area. That's more oil than the reserves in Texas. Today's market price for Alaskan oil delivered on the West Coast is $36, which means that much more oil would be economic. Can your department provide the committee with economically recoverable estimates for ANWR based on today's prices? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that, those calculations uh, were done when the initial uh, USG, USGS estimate was done, and we would be happy to provide those to you. Thank you. I'd like to also ask you if, if you're familiar with the Argonne National Laboratory study that studied the impact of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline in the North, North Slope oil fields? Um, I, I believe I know which study you're talking about, but... It's the BLM study for the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. BLM? Okay. The, no, it was, they were the contractor for BLM. It, they were the contractor for BLM on the, on okay. the study. Yes. How does that study characterize the overall impacts of oil development on Alaska's North Slope? Um, I'll have to provide you with that information in writing. Okay. I'd also like to ask you, in your testimony, you talked about that there were currently 140 million, I believe that's the accurate figure, 140 million acres of land within Alaska that is currently protected. Could you describe for me um, those lands, how they're protected, and under what status they're under? Uh, that figure includes the national park areas. It includes those areas in the uh, Forest Service, uh, for example, within forests that are wilderness areas. Uh, it includes other areas of refuge. And so those are the areas that are um, not multiple use areas and not regular Forest Service areas. So that's 140, approximately 140 million acres of land that is set aside under, under a conservation status uh, in, in one way or another that cannot be used. That is correct. And I believe that your testimony stated that that is bigger than the size of California and New York combined? Yes, uh, when you put those acreages together, uh, that is, uh, there's an area as large as California and New York that is currently protected. The, your testimony went into great detail on what, is, what the bill demands in terms of environmental protections. And I think we're all interested in, in that aspect of it. And I know that we've spent a great deal of time over the years looking at what, what any possible environmental impact could be and trying to respond to that. And I believe that this legislation is kind of a summation of all of that work that's gone together. But in your testimony, you talked about the new technology that is being used and going from gravel roads to ice roads and in a relatively short period of time they have discovered ways to even further minimize the environmental impact. When you look at the future, can you give the committee any kind of idea as to what new technologies are currently being developed? There are changes taking place all the time, and even in just a few short years, you begin to see new technologies. And since we began discussions about this in 2001, uh, we've seen greater movement uh, toward using technologies that would be like offshore uh, oil platforms that would, in essence, um, not have a, a permanent structure affixed to the ground, but would instead have a, a platform above the ground. And so that would minimize even beyond the current small gravel pads, uh, the impact on the tundra. Uh, there are other things that are being researched as ways to try to minimize the effects and to try to have more and more environmentally protective technologies. As we learn more as we go through the process, as those new technologies come online, the standards 
that would be applied to development uh, would themselves change. It has to be the, the best commercially available technology that is applied whenever any activity goes forward. And so as that standard is enhanced by new technological development, the bar keeps going up. Finally, I think we all know that if exploration is done, that there will be some impact. And, and you will be able to see something there if, if you fly over it. But I think the, the argument that you cannot have economic development and protect our environment is a, a false argument. And, and we can and have in the past been able to do, do a project like this without having a, a significant impact on the environment. I uh, appreciate your testimony a great deal. I think you did a fantastic job. Um, before I recognize uh, Congressman Markey for his questions, I'll just say that I did receive a letter from Congressman Markey requesting a hearing on H.R. 770, and I did. I responded to that letter that was sent to me, and just for the record, I'd like to read one paragraph out of the letter. I'm looking forward to holding a field hearing on all matters related to Anwar in Kiktovik, Alaska, a location which is in the heart of the area under consideration. Um, and hopefully in that hearing we can further look at a number of the, the issues affecting ANWR and their impact. I invite Mr. Markey and, and all the members of the committee to attend that field hearing because I do believe it's extremely important that we continue to work on this issue regardless of the outcome of, of this legislation. Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I thank you for the hearing. Um, I just wish it would be conducted before we would actually have a markup of the bill here in the um, Natural Resources Committee. Uh, if you would give me that commitment that we would actually have the hearing first and then the markup, I think the sequence at least would reflect uh, um, the uh, importance that the members would be exposed to those um, issues. Um, I know that that's not going to happen because um, there has already been a determination on the part of the majority Republican Party that they want to drill in the uh, Arctic uh, refuge. Um, Madam Secretary, um, Gerald Ford, back, back in the night, I've been on this committee now for uh, 27 years. 27 years. So I was back here in the 70s, and uh, the great Mo Udall used to sit up where Mr. Pombo sits now, and he constructed a very nice balance for us on the committee. He led the effort uh, to uh, double the fuel economy standards for uh, vehicles in the United States from 13 and a half uh, miles per gallon to 27 miles per gallon from 1976 to 1986. Gerald Ford, a Republican president, signed that bill even though he came from Michigan. And uh, at the same time, Mo was able to say to us, and it also gives us a chance to look at the Arctic and preserve that for generations to come because we're going to ensure that the technology which consumes oil, and we know that 70 percent of all oil consumed in the United States goes into gasoline tanks, uh, is, uh, is done in a way which is uh, most technologically efficient. Now sad to say, Madam Secretary, uh, the United States now averages only 24 miles per gallon. We've gone backwards. Uh, over the last uh, a decade, and uh, we now only average what the United States averaged in 1981. Now I marvel at the wonderful technological capacity which you believe will make it possible for us to drill in a pristine uh, uh, refuge without leaving any damage, uh, but at the same time you represent the Bush administration which is opposing any significant increase in the fuel economy standards for vehicles in the United States. Uh, as a now, matter of fact, uh, Representative now, Markey, If I may, uh, just let me finish my point. And as a result, what, uh, what we're confronted with here is an imperative that you say 
forces us into this Arctic refuge, um, which is avoidable. If a goal was set to increase to 35 or 40 miles per gallon the fuel economy standards for our country, which the Bush administration adamantly opposes. In fact, last year on the House floor, I had an amendment which would have put the fuel economy standards at 27 miles per gallon, which is the bill that Gerald Ford signed in 1975. And the Bush administration opposed putting the fuel economy standards back to where it was in 1975 as a law. And so to go, in, to go into the Arctic to provide oil for vehicles that are only going to become less and less efficient as each generation goes by, unless the Bush administration steps up, of course necessitates us going into the refuge. But I ask you, do you, do you support the, imp the increase in fuel economy standards to 35 or 40 miles per gallon? I very much support the idea of having better fuel economy for vehicles. The administration, for example, just proposed the largest increase ever in the fuel economy standards for sport utility vehicles. The question is safety and whether you go about setting those standards by having Congress decide what the standards should be or whether you have a process that allows the safety of families to be considered as a part of setting those fuel economy standards. But as what you know right now, Madam Secretary, a family driving in a regular car is 16 times more likely to have a fatality in that vehicle as someone in an SUV. So what's happening is as these SUVs get bigger and bigger and less and less fuel economical, every other vehicle is becoming much more dangerous for families to be driving in. And so, yeah, there's a safety question, but the question is how big uh, is too big uh, in terms of every other vehicle on the highway? And that's linked to the fuel economy standard. So I just think that the administration itself is in technological denial. Uh, for the long term, the President has proposed the Freedom Car and Freedom Fuel initiative that would move us towards hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And that is something that really gets us beyond the I agree the with you. And, I, and I, hope he puts on the, I hope he puts on the goal the uh, non-fat cheese pizza uh, as a long term goal as well. Meanwhile, let's make sure we all have uh, low cholesterol diets today and let's make sure also that we have vehicles that are efficient because we may never have a hydrogen car and we may never have a uh, fat free cheese pizza. So yeah, it's a dream. It's a wonderful. Let's hope we get it. But today we have off the shelf fuel economy technology that we can build into vehicles, whole, the whole fleet, to give Americans a choice of a fuel uh, um, economy standard for SUVs that is, um, uh, that is uh, consistent with their goal to protect the environment. And let me, on that front, HR 39 applies to the leasing requirements for the um, uh, applies the leasing, re leasing requirements of the uh, National Petroleum Reserve to the Arctic Refuge. But a GA GAO study last year found that currently there is a $6 billion liability for cleanup and reclamation on the North Slope. The Department of Interior's comments on the report included a promise to conduct a review uh, of, of the financial insurances in order to protect the environment and taxpayers. Yet the $6 billion liability still is sitting there staring us in the face. Why should we invite this massive cleanup liability upon the Arctic refuge while it has yet to be mitigated uh, outside the refuge on the North Slope? What guarantee would the American public have that uh, the oil companies or the Department of Interior will get serious in the refuge when they haven't shown uh, that seriousness uh, on the ref rest of the uh, North Slope. The, no the gentleman's time has expired. I'll allow the Secretary to answer his question and then we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, we have no jurisdiction over the area where that $6 billion figure comes from. Uh, that is the state lands area from the, the older Prudhoe Bay facilities. 
In NPRA now, we have financial assurances, and I have asked my staff to look at even greater strengthening of the financial assurances there and elsewhere across the country. I think it is very important to have that. That is why we demanded greater assurances for continuation of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System as well than what is required by law or what has ever been required before. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Duncan. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this uh, very important hearing this morning. And I want to thank uh, the Secretary for her, I think, very dispassionate, factual, and fair presentation of uh, uh, the case in regard to this um, work being done in Anwar. I think one of the problems that we have is that people look at a map of the entire country on one little page in a book. And you really, they really can't comprehend how huge this area is, this 19.8 million acres. This, I represent the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and it, it is by far the most heavily visited national park in the country with almost 10 million visitors a year. And all, all, of, those, all of those millions of people come there, and they think that area is huge. And it, yet it's 600,000 acres. It's it, the... the uh, Anwar is 19, it is uh, 35 times the size of the Great Smokies. You just can't even comprehend how huge this area is. And I, I'm, I think I'm one of the few, or one of the small percentage of members who not only has been to Anwar, but I've been there twice. I've been to Prudhoe Bay, I've been to, C uh, to uh, Barrow, I've been to Kaktovik. And I'm told that the 270 or so people who live in Kaktovik are the only people who actually live inside this 19.8 million acres. And I was interested in the advertisement that you showed, uh, Madam Secretary, because <coughs> when you go up there, you see that there's not a bush or tree as far as the eye can see. In fact, uh, my first visit there, I, I met a lawyer uh, from Anchorage who had practiced law in Tennessee uh, several years earlier, and he was not connected to any group, but when he found out where I was going, he told me, he said, he laughed, and he said, if you see anything taller than two feet up there, it was put there yesterday by a man. And yet, uh, uh, the area on which uh, uh, people wish to drill is not even 10% of this Anwar. It's not even 1%. In fact, it's not even one-tenth of 1%. I understand it's at most a few thousand acres, a minuscule portion, a minuscule portion of this area. Then last year, a year and a half ago, when we confronted this issue, I read in Time magazine that there were only 1,000 visitors to Anwar, hikers and backpackers and so forth, in the year prior to that. 1,000 into this uh, 19.8 million acres. It's really amazing. And yet, this, as the ad showed, the people who are opponents to this have to resort to uh, false or misleading advertisement to, to keep their contributions up. And I think that's what this is primarily about, is getting contributions for some of these groups. But you know, you don't hurt, Mr. Chairman, you don't hurt the wealthy upper income people who contribute to these groups when you uh, destroy these jobs and keep these oil prices higher or drive them higher. Who you hurt are the poor and the lower income and the working people of this country. And I, th I wish that we could keep uh, some of those people in mind when we're considering this. But uh, I don't have any questions at this time, but I do want to thank you for the presentation that you made because I think it was a very fine presentation, Madam Secretary, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Madam Secretary, thank you very much for your testimony. I, too, am one of those who have served on this committee a long time and have been around this issue for a very long time. I've tried to study it from, uh, from both sides of the, uh, of the debate. I've spent a lot of time with the oil companies in my district, a lot of time with CEOs of the oil companies involved in, uh, in the Arctic, and have looked at a lot of their proposals for reducing the footprint and the technologies. And it is truly amazing. But I'm not sure that this debate is really about that. As one of the CEOs of the major players said, we know we can do it, we know we can extract it, and we think we can do it without environmental damage. But this is a value question for the American people, and we'll have to wait and see what their judgment is. 
And I think that's what we're down to at this point. It is a value judgment. You can call this a white, uh, a white nothingness or whatever. I forget what your, your phrase was in your, in your opening statement in, in March. I've been there and it looks a lot like that. But it also has a, a, a huge diversity of characteristics uh, that warrant its, uh, its protection. And that's why the Congress made that decision. It may not have uh, the 300-foot sequoias that we have in California. It may not have the deep canyons of Yosemite. It may not have uh, whatever the Great Smokies have in terms of their, their values. But it does have values that the American people have come to prize. And the American people prize many areas of the world where they've never been. They think the Gobi Desert is valuable. They think the Arctic is valuable. They think the Antarctic is valuable. They think that the Andes are valuable. They've never been there in likelihood. They may never get to go there. But that doesn't remove their values. And uh, uh, this is a matter we can, we can have dueling reports and dueling statistics about whether or not this will increase or not. I can read one here that from, your, from the Department of uh, Energy, which says that uh, if you take the production of expected production of Anwar in 2020, it will re reduce our dependence on foreign oil from 62% to 60%. If you got really excited, you'd go from 62% to 57%. That's a lot of oil. It's a lot of money. But the fact of the matter is it also says that we would dramatically increase, increase domestic production, but we will not produce our way out of the crisis we have. I happen to support the idea of Mr. Markey and many others. That, uh, that until at such time as we, uh, as we seriously confront the usage of this oil, you're never going to make the hurdle on this debate. Because I think it's very simple for the American people. If this oil is so valuable, if it's so valuable as this administration says and the other proponents of drilling it, if it's that valuable, then why do we waste it? If it's so critical to our national economy, why do we waste it? If it's so critical to our national defense, why do we waste it? If it's so critical to our standing in the world and our relationships in the Middle East, why do we waste it? And that's what they see, is that you want to go get what you consider the most valuable commodity in the world, the most geopolitical sensitive commodity in the world, and you want to put it into a car that gets 12 miles a gallon. It doesn't make any sense to the American public. It must not be that valuable. But the fact is, it is that valuable. And at a time when we say to the oil companies, you can go drill and we mandate that you use, the, what is it, the phrase, the, the most commercially available technology, best commercially available technology, I think it's a phrase. But we don't turn around and say to the automobile industry, we mandate that you use the best commercially available technology to achieve the mileage standards. But until such time as you do that, I don't think you can make the hump here with the American people. Because they do value the Arctic refuge. They do value its characteristics. And they don't understand why, why, why a country wouldn't treat this as a valuable commodity. But we don't. We waste it in our lighting, and we waste it in our transportation. And those are the two biggest uses where we can have immediate changes. Not the Freedom Car, the Freedom Fry, but today, tomorrow, and the next day. It's all available. We have demonstrations down here in the mall. Many of us have gone down and visited the General Motors when they bring all the college students to town to redesign the cars. UC Davis, yours has had one. Riverside has won one of the competitions where they've had mileage to SUVs of, of 10, 15, 20, 25 percent. These are college students working for three months over the summer. So I don't think we're going we're to advance this ar uh, argument much further. Uh, and I think that uh, until such time as this country gets very, very serious about energy conservation, uh, and, and the wise use of the soil, that this will continue to be stalemated because it doesn't justify the invasion of the, uh, of the Arctic refuge uh, to, to, uh, to continue to waste uh, this, uh, this resource and to continue to risk uh, our national security in the manner in which we use the imported oil. So thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I'm sure we'll all see one another again on this, uh, on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Secretary. I was not here for your testimony. Um, I was here when you testified on this issue before. And I would like to remind Mr. Miller, why didn't he just say this is speech A? And I would say mine speech B. We can save a lot of time. We, 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 it's, it's, it's the same speech I've heard for the last 30 years. I sat right in this room when we passed the Alaska National Lands Act and the Congress set aside this land to be developed at the wishes of the Congress for this good of this nation. Scoop Jackson did this, Bo Udall did this, and they agreed to this. And, you know, I, I, I sit here and listen with amazement when people talk about the, uh, the, the ANWR, or the 1002 areas, and uh, Madam uh, Secretary, 
you're right. The people that live there, the people that know what it's like, support the drilling, the people of Alaska support the drilling, and it would be good for this nation. Now, I have offered many times in the, in the energy conference uh, we had last year, I offered them one time, let us just take the native oil and let them use that oil. That's their oil. But the fork and tongue of the white man is working again. We gave them the land for economic well-being. We gave them the land for their social well-being, and it is their land, and now we say you can't use it. Now, that's, uh, that's wrong. If you don't want to take the rest of it, fine. You, you can have a decision. But to do this to those native people up there is absolutely wrong. And that's what we're doing. And as far as American people not supporting this, American people do support an animal, opening an war right now. They do support it. But we have a few people in this Congress pander to the special interest group. The environmental community does not want this nation to have the great economy they had in the past. That's really what it's all about. This is a small piece of land, 2,000 acres, and that is all. 2,000 acres, and you'd think Alaska didn't have other acreage up there? 147, 447 million acres you set aside. That's bigger than all the states on this side. About five times bigger than your state. Set aside for no other use than wildlife and viewing and wilderness. And we're talking about 2,000 acres. So, Madam Secretary, I get a little excited about this because I've been fighting it a long time. And I will win this battle. May not be this year, but it will happen. And I'll stay here until it's done. I'll live to be 150 years old until it's done. And you'll be dead, and you'll be dead. You won't be, but I'll be here. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <laughs> the, uh, you heard the bells going off. We have a vote on the floor. We're going to temporarily recess the committee. As soon as the votes are complete, we will Mr. come Chairman. back. Mr. Markey? I'm just going to go get uh, my cholesterol count so I can make sure I stay alive as long as uh, <laughs> is necessary to outlive Mr. Thank you. Madam Secretary, apologize for the delay. We're going to start with Mr. Renzi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you for your testimony. It was uh, intriguing and, and really, uh, from a knowledge base, was a good teaching tool for me. I want to, I want to let you know that uh, the ranking member spoke about Moda Udall. And it's interesting to note, Moda Udall built a concrete ditch through the state of Arizona, my home state, over 700 miles long to bring water out of the Colorado River through pristine desert and ecosystems, sensitive habitat, because he believed that water was absolute to the future of Arizona. And during your testimony, you talked about the existing pipeline and the decline in the existing oil supplies and how eventually that pipeline will be empty at some point in the future. And what I'd like to talk to you and ask you about is, if we look at the existing pipeline and we look at the length of the little stem that needs to be complete to get us over to the area where the natural reserves are, how, long are we, how far are we talking approximately and what kind of impact and, and what kind of use, obviously, will there be for the, for the existing pipeline if we go in and, and pull these resources out? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as each of the new facilities has been constructed, there are pipelines that connect it to the uh, end of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, so the oil can then be transported through that pipeline. Uh, the current uh, production is taking place in an area that is as close as 30, 35 miles to the edge of Anwar. And so a pipeline would have to be constructed basically uh, 35 miles, 40 miles, uh, and then further depending on how far into the 1002 area the development occurred. It's essentially just the uh, construction of a pipeline uh, those are suspended, so there just are some pylons on the tundra that would be the uh, effect of the pipeline. We're really looking at just 35 or 40 miles to get us at least to the initial edge of where we need to go, 
and then we're able to go back and tie into the main pipeline to take us down to Valdez. Yes, and there, okay. there's uh, certainly capacity in the current Trans-Alaska pipeline to carry the additional oil. There's, there's no need for uh, an additional uh, amount of uh, overall pipeline capacity because the, the Trans-Alaska pipeline at one point carried almost 2 million barrels a day. Uh, today it is down to about half of that and continuing to decline as the Prudhoe Bay oil itself is tapped out and the production there declines. Thank you. Knowing Mo Udall as I, as I did, I'm sure he would have been in favor of it. Thank you. Mr. Hanahosa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is my first meeting for your committee, and uh, I want to reserve the, uh, the right to uh, ask questions of the secretary uh, later on. If I may pass this time, I would appreciate that. Well, welcome to the, to the committee, and if we do have a second round before the secretary is excused, you're more than welcome to ask questions or after the next, uh, next questioner, you may as well. Thank you, Chairman Pombo. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Secretary. Are there other, uh, in discussing the, the techniques of drilling, are there other properties that the Department of the Interior manages in, in Alaska? Uh, we manage a huge area of land in Alaska. It is millions upon millions of acres. And uh, Madam Secretary, is, uh, have the techniques of drilling been implemented in other areas uh, of Alaska? Uh, it, actually, the, the area that we administer where uh, the energy potential is being utilized onshore is the National Petroleum Reserve, and that is still at the early stages of development there. Uh, so primarily the activities where that new te technology is being used are on uh, state lands or native corporation-owned lands. And in those areas, uh, we're seeing the, the new technology um, having those examples of reaching underground for miles in order to uh, tap the subsurface resource while leaving the surface undisturbed. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary, do those, are those techniques sustainable? In other words, uh, can, can the companies afford to do that and, and still withdraw the, the production? And secondly, are, are the effects on the environment uh, basically what, what the, uh, the developers of the technology are claiming? The ability to use that technology depends on the size of the resource that mm -hmm. is available. And so in many areas of the lower 48, you certainly could not support that kind of expensive technology. Uh, the, the resource that's available just would not justify that sort of expenditure. Uh, in Alaska, however, the experience in other areas uh, and in the experience on the North Slope is that that technology is certainly justified. The areas where we are seeing the greatest reach underground with the horizontal drilling are areas on the North Slope. And so that um, is working out in reality. Uh, they're constantly setting new records for how far they can reach underground without an impact on the surface. So my understanding of that technology is that it is working out very well. It allows you to have your wells uh, on the, the surface located in a very small area and then reach out for a long distance underground. Mr. Chairman, uh, what are some of the daily outputs of, of these wells that we're drilling there? Do you happen to know that? It's, it's a fairly technical question, but... Uh... I'd be happy to provide that uh, for you. We do have um, overall the, the field production is, is in one of the handouts. Um, I know there is information available about uh, the production from various facilities. But I don't have that off the top of my head. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a concluding statement that I think the, the point's been well made by those who, who maybe are opposing, but the, but the same point uh, will apply to those who are in favor of that the consumers will ultimately decide 
exactly what the values are in this. That as the price escalates, the price of natural or price of gasoline at the pump goes over two dollars to three dollars because of restricted supplies. I think that the voters will send a very clear message what their values are in this particular relationship. Mr. Chairman, I uh, support this project and appreciate the chance to speak. Thank you. I, I'll just say that we are intending on holding a field hearing in the in the region. And I would highly recommend that, that members of the committee take advantage of that opportunity uh, to go up there and actually see it. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience what the picture that you've got in your mind's eye of this region uh, is, not, is inaccurate. Because once you go up there and actually see it, you see what they're doing, uh, how the, the exploration is occurring, uh, what the area is like, what the tundra is like, it gives you a very different picture and a much clearer view of what is being attempted to be done uh, in Anwar and in, in this particular region. Uh, are there any further questions that the committee has of the Madam Secretary? Seeing none, Ms. Norton, it, before I excuse you, I'll tell you, I just wanted to say that I very very much enjoyed your testimony. It was very well done, very well thought out, very informative, and it is something that I think will prove to be of great value uh, to this committee as we move for forward in our deliberation uh, and any possible future action that we may have on ANWR and including that as part of the energy bill. Um, this is an issue that, that we have been working on for a long time. And it, there are obviously a lot of opinions, uh, a lot of opposed and, uh, and proponents of this particular project. Uh, but I think that what you brought to the committee will be very helpful, and I thank you for your testimony. I also say that I know that there are members who may have further questions. They will submit those to you, <laughs> submit those to you in writing. And uh, if you could answer those in a timely fashion uh, so that they can be included in the, in the hearing record, it would be appreciated by the committee. We would be happy to do so. Before I excuse you, I'm going to just briefly go to Mr. Inslee. I know that uh, he was trying to get over here before you were excused, and since I was a little slow in my concluding statements, he made it. So, <laughs> Mr. Inslee. Thank, thank you for your courtesy. Uh, Madam Secretary, it, it, it strikes me that you have a very difficult job for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is I think uh, people broadly feel about the Arctic uh, a little bit the way they feel about the Mona Lisa, in that it's something most Americans will never see, although they might like to. It's something they feel that has a, a very unique beauty and is very treasured in the country. And it's something that they understand that the industry has made very, very uh, impressive gains in technology to try to reduce the amount of the footprint that would be put at least on the surface of, of the refuge. But I think that they feel very strongly that a small footprint is like a small, putting a small mustache on the Mona Lisa. And that hundreds or thousands of acres is at least a mustache on, on this wilderness that is currently treated as a, a very, very successful refuge. And so I think you've got a very difficult job to convince the American people that this scar, and it will be a scar no matter what technology can afford us, right in the heart, and I've been there, and it is the heart of this refuge. And I think the American people's assessment is more accurate than some of the assessments I've heard today, calling this sort of a white wasteland or something. Uh, I've been there, and I have to tell you, I've been to Yellowstone Glacier National Park, which may not have glaciers in 100 years, by the way, because of global warming. We're going to have to rename it Puddle National Park or something. Uh, I've been to the bayous of Louisiana. I've been to the, the rainforest of the Olympics. I've been, you know, a lot of different places in this country. But the single most impressive, from a biological standpoint, place I've ever been is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Because at least for a period of about two months, it is the single most exciting, uh, prolific breeding ground for life in America. 
the bird life, the caribou, the grizzly, it's a 24-hour explosion of life there. And I'm convinced that at least the 600,000 people I represent feel very strongly about preserving that, no matter what technology does. And I just I want to ask one question about your presentation. In your presentation on your chart, somebody took the chart down, I'm sorry, but in your chart, it made reference, I may not get this language exactly correct, but it made reference to using the best available environmentally sensitive technology. I think it was number two in, in the list. I don't know if you have that it language. It is the best commercially available technology. The best commercially available technology. Um, I want to ask you about that because what I've heard you say is you would, the administration would commit to use the best available commercial technology, which is good. The problem is your administration you work for has totally failed America in using the best commercial available technology in the energy field because it is, has an abysmal record in trying to use the best available commercial technology in our transportation sector. Because the best available commercial technology, which we stopped making improvements on in the 1980s, is not being used. And the administration you work for has resisted efforts to make terribly modest improvements of three miles a gallon in our fleet. And you know, and I know, that if we had simply continued making the improvements in our mileage of our vehicles that we made in the 70s and early 80s, if we simply had continued on that pace, we would have freed ourselves from all of the oil in Iraq and probably all of the oil of Saudi Arabia. So the question I have is, what do you personally think about your administration's refusal to engage in any substantial improvement of, of using really commercially available technology, the best available technology in our transportation sector. What do you think about that? I believe you are ignoring a very large part of what this administration has done. The freedom fuels and freedom car uh, approach that the president has proposed is a significant step forward. It would be the next generation of automobiles, and his proposal is going to move us much more quickly toward hydrogen fuel cell powered automobiles. It gets us beyond all of this debate about the regular gasoline powered engines. In the much shorter run, uh, we have to deal with our cars as they're currently gasoline powered. Uh, we have proposed uh, that, that during that interim time period, as part of the President's energy plan, there be a tax credit for alternative fuel and, uh, for example, the, the electric and gasoline uh, combo powered cars. And I think that allows individual families to make the choice to have a cleaner technology car. I think that's a great approach and that, that is part of our proposal. Uh, we also believe that we ought to be in increasing fuel efficiency. And we have proposed the largest increase ever in fuel, in fuel efficiency uh, standards for sport utility vehicles and other light trucks. Uh, the, the major difference is whether the safety assessment, how we protect America's families in their automobile safety, be a choice made by the experts in automobile safety as opposed to having that be done by congressional fiat. The gentleman's time has expired, and I look forward to the entire debate on CAFE standards as, as we get into it, because I believe that we've had some selective choosing of what the facts are on CAFE standards. But Madam Secretary, I appreciate your testimony. We're going to excuse you at this time, but there are other members that do have questions that they will submit to you in writing. Thank you very much for thank your you testimony. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience today. Thank you. I'd like to call up our second panel of witnesses. Um, Ms. Tara Sweeney, representing the Governor of Alaska. Ms. Jamie Clark, representing the National Wildlife Federation. Mr. Peter Van Tyne of Trustees for Alaska, and Kim Bo Ken Boyd, the former director of oil and gas for Alaska. 
uh, if you'd join us at the witness table. I'd also like to state that uh, James Schlesinger, who had intended to testify in favor of opening Anwar as part of our national energy security, was forced to cancel this morning. Uh, he will submit testimony for the record, and with unanimous consent, that will be included at the appropriate place. Where's the thing to swear on, man? Okay. If I could just, before you guys get too comfortable, if I, I could have you stand and raise your right hand. Need one more. There he is. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that the responses given and statements made will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Ms. Sweeney, we are going to begin with you. Um, just as a reference point, the, um, you will be allowed five minutes for your oral testimony. Your entire written testimony will be included in the record. The lights that appear in front of you on the witness table have a, a green light a yellow light to sum up and then a red light to stop. So if you could try to keep to uh, the time limit as much as possible, it would be appreciated. Ms. Sweeney. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting the state of Alaska to pr present testimony on H.R. 39 today. My name is Tara McLean Sweeney. I am the Special Staff Assistant to the Governor of the State of Alaska for Rural Affairs and Education. On behalf of Governor Frank Murkowski, I would like to reaffirm Alaska's support for responsible development of the Coastal Plain area located within the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, or ANWR. Responsible development of ANWR's Coastal Plain is critical to the economic well-being of the residents of Alaska and the national security of the United States. It is also very important to my people, the Inupet Eskimos, who live on the North Slope. Oil development is our only economy. It provides our jobs, our tax base, and our essential public services. As you debate and act on this important issue in the session ahead, I urge you to consider the impact your decisions will have on the residents of Alaska, the citizens of this great country, and the Inupet people of the North Slope. Alaska crude oil production is very important to the nation. Over the years, Alaska has produced and safely transported over 13 billion barrels of oil from the North Slope oil fields to U.S. consumers. Every day, the most populated state in the nation, California, consumes about 1.8 million barrels of oil, while producing about 890,000 barrels of oil. This is a production to consumption deficit of almost 1 million barrels per day, of which over half are imported from foreign countries. One million barrels is the amount of spare capacity in the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which can be filled by oil produced from ANWR. In other words, if Congress opened the coastal plain of ANWR, California would not have to import any foreign oil. Mr. Chairman, I would appreciate a few minutes of the committee's time to address H.R. 39 in my separate and personal capacity as an Alaska <coughs> native. I am an Inupet Eskimo raised in Barrow on Alaska's North Slope. The very large majority of the Inupiat people support opening the coastal plain of Anwar. They support this action because the nation needs our oil and natural gas resources. They also support it because these energy resources can be developed safely with no harm to our homeland, our environment, our caribou, and our fish and wildlife. We know this because my people are the stewards of the North Slope's lands, waters, and wildlife. The area is our kitchen. Our villages depend on our wildlife for 50 to 70 percent of our subsistence diet. This subsistence dependence means that the Inupet people insist on the best practices, the best technology, and the best regulation in the development of North Slope energy resources. My people have achieved this important objective through our local government, the North Slope Borough. The borough has jurisdiction over the permits required for geologic surveys, exploration, and production. 
The Inupiat people provided the input necessary to accommodate development and to meet America's need for oil while protecting our traditional subsistence lifestyle and cultural practices. We did not ante up our land with no protection provisions for caribou and other wildlife. Instead, we created a planning and zoning department in the North Slope Borough to oversee the industry permits and provide an opportunity for our area experts, our hunters, to submit comments and concerns. We created a fish and wildlife department to monitor wildlife and make recommendations on how to protect our subsistence resources. We did not go into the prospect of oil development lightly. It is with our involvement that development and wildlife can coexist today. Development for the Inupiat people means the privilege of providing running water and flush toilets, police, fire, and search and rescue protections, local schools for our children, local health care facilities, and an opportunity to champion our own causes. As Native people, we do not have a hierarchy for traditional food. The caribou is just as important to our souls as the whale. We cannot live without both. This is an important point to remember when deliberating this issue. We would not recommend development if it sacrificed our access to caribou. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for your attention. On behalf of the state of Alaska, I want to thank Chairman Pombo for scheduling this most important hearing. I also want to thank Congressman Young for introducing H.R. 39 and keeping this issue front and center. Thank you. And Ms. Clark, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Jamie Rappaport Clark, the National Wildlife Federation's Senior Vice President for Conservation Programs. On behalf of the nation's largest member-supported conservation advocacy and education organization, we thank you for the opportunity to address this committee this morning. I would like to present to you the essence of the case to oppose oil drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. First, what would drilling mean to the wildlife that depends on the refuge's coastal plain? The porcupine caribou herd that finds its central calving ground there. The polar bears that find their mainland denning habitat there. The musk oxen that live year-round there. The 135 bird species that congregate by the millions there in their migration spanning all 50 states and four continents of the globe. The comprehensive study completed in 1987 during the Reagan administration concluded that drilling would have major adverse impacts on the coastal plains wildlife. Last week, the National Academy of Sciences released its finding on the cumulative impacts of the 30 years of oil drilling that has already been conducted along the North Slope. Again, the conclusion is that oil drilling has long-term adverse impacts harming the landscape and altering wildlife habitat and behavior well beyond the area given over to drilling rigs and processing facilities. These findings underscore the fragility of the Arctic tundra environment and the sensitivity to disruption of the wildlife that depends on it. It's important to note, Mr. Chairman, that nearly 95 percent of the Alaskan North Slope is already available for potential oil exploration or development. The U.S. Geological Survey reports that far more oil can be recovered from these areas than could ever be obtained from the Arctic refuge. Mr. Chairman, in 1997, while I served as director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I was privileged to celebrate, along with this committee and with Congress, the passage of organic legislation governing the system, the National Wildlife Refuge System Improvement Act, a law that clearly states that refuges are places where wildlife comes first. The bedrock principle of that law is that no activity will be allowed in a wildlife refuge that is incompatible with the purposes for which the refuge is formed the conservation of wildlife and natural resource values. Never since the National Wildlife Refuge System was formalized has oil drilling ever been initiated in, an initiated in an existing unit. To open the Arctic Refuge to oil drilling will set a precedent shattering decades of practice and render a crippling blow to the principle that only activities compatible with wildlife conservation should be allowed within the National Wildlife Refuge System. If this exception to law and tradition is permitted, the door will be open to the next claim that an additional few weeks of oil supply can be found if only we'll sacrifice another protected landscape. Mr. Chairman, what will be the message Congress sends if it has the courage to again reject proposals to open their Arctic refuge to oil drilling? With only 3 percent of the world's known oil reserve, but 25 percent of the world's annual oil consumption, 
The message will be, we cannot drill our way to energy security. Rather, the true path to energy independence is to decrease our reliance on oil. With new technologies, it can make our cars go further on a gallon of gas. The message will be that we need to focus on energy conservation and developing cleaner, safer, and cheaper alternative sources of fuel. Our short-term energy problems should not blind us to the risk of damaging forever places Americans care about and wildlife depend on most. Two days from now, on March 14th, America will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the day President Theodore Roosevelt established the first refuge at Pelican Island off of Florida's east coast. The refuge system now safeguards habitat for more than 1,000 species of animals, is a wonderland of outdoor recreation, and spans all 50 states in an area exceeding the size of the national park system. We must not mark the 100 years of achievement by authorizing the violation of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the crown jewel of America's spectacular National Wildlife Refuge system. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Van Tyne. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am Peter Van Tyne, an attorney with Trustees for Alaska, a public interest environmental law firm founded over a quarter of a century ago. For over a decade, I have represented conservation groups, Alaska Native tribes and villages, and others who are concerned about the effects of oil drilling on the environment in Alaska. I thank you for inviting me to testify before you today on the issue of whether to allow drilling for oil on the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and I urge you to oppose such drilling. I speak today on H.R. 39's main environmental premise that this bill provides for an environmentally sound drilling program on the coastal plain. This premise is wrong for a variety of reasons. First, oil and pristine environments simply do not mix. The history of development to the west of the coastal plain has shown us that adverse impacts are inevitable. Just last week, the National Academy of Science documented in a 390-page report the pollution and impact legacy of Prudhoe Bay and other North Slope oil fields. Lack of field maintenance has resulted in injury and death to North Slope workers and oil spills from corroding pipelines. BP is currently on criminal probation for its role in illegal waste disposal practices on the North Slope. Drilling proponents rely on the wonders of new technology to support their little to no impact claims, yet new technology offers nothing new to the discussion. In 1978, BP declared that Prudhoe Bay would not harm the wilderness character of the area. Today, Prudhoe Bay and other North Slope oil fields depicted on the map on the easel can easily be seen from space. More recently, drilling proponents point to the Alpine development in the Culver River Delta as their best example of doing it right development. Alpine has two drill sites, a jet runway, three miles of infield roads, 37 miles of pipeline, and what was to truly set it apart from older fields, no road linking it to the existing fields to its east. Yet Alpine's reality is no different from the other industrial oil fields. During its construction, ARCO lost 2.3 million gallons of drilling muds under the Colville River. Massive air traffic occurs in the middle of the migratory bird nesting season, which is the unspoken secret of roadless development. Further, gas flaring from Alpine has at times exceeded all the other North Slope oil fields combined raising alarms about links to an increase in asthma cases in the nearby Alaska Native community of Nuiqsut. Oh, and despite repeated calls to do so, regulators did no in-depth environmental review of Alpine before permitting it to proceed. And of course, the inexorable creek of oil drilling continues. Industry has now proposed a massive expansion of the Alpine field. Fifteen new drill sites, these are depicted on this map. Twenty-five miles of new gravel road two new runways, and new gravel mines and pipelines. And get this, the state now proposes to build a gravel road from the existing oil fields west to the Colville Delta, smashing the roadless development myth. Sadly, the drilling proponents promise for this bill of an environmentally sound refuge drilling program is an acknowledgement that we do not require that of existing industry. The oil industry is exempt from a multitude of environmental laws that apply to every other sector of the economy from the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act to the Toxic Release Inventory to provisions of the Clean Water Act, we subsidize the oil industry by making the American environment pay the price. 
Moreover, the reality of H.R. 39 is different than its promise. Its provisions exempt significant parts of a coastal plain drilling program from fundamental environmental laws. Every provision of the bill purportedly designed to meet the mandatory will protect standard of its statement of intent is discretionary in nature, creating a hole you could drive a thumper truck through. Is it any wonder that I was asked today to provide you with a letter from the Gwich'in nation, nation opposing H.R. 39? The very culture of these indigenous people is founded on the caribou and a pristine coastal plain. Do we risk their cultural annihilation too? Taking a broader perspective, why do we need to commit the entirety of America's Arctic to oil drilling? As it stands, without oil from the refuge, the Department of Energy predicts a 27% increase in oil from Alaska by 2020. And it is no wonder. Alaska and the Department of Interior are aggressively leasing all other parts of America's Arctic to the oil industry. This map depicts it. 9.8 million acres in the Beaufort Sea. 23 million acres in the NPRA, either now leased or being open for leases in the next several years. 14 million on state lands every single year. I have stood in both the developed and undeveloped Arctic. We as humans simply are not living up to our potential if we cannot protect one small slice of the Arctic. That place, as Justice Douglas described it, of startling beauties of creation, of quiet and solitude, where life exists without molestation by man. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boyd. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Ken Boyd, and I'm currently an oil and gas consultant in Alaska. From 1995 until early 2001, I was director of the Alaska Division of Oil and Gas. I've worked in the oil and gas business in a variety of capacities since 1973, much of that time working on Alaska exploration. Mr. Chairman, you've had a lot of background information today. I'm going to try not to go back and revisit all that, but cherry pick some of my testimony. Uh, I want to reemphasize what Secretary Norton said about the 1002 area. It was not chosen arbitrarily. This is the 8 percent of the NWR that's actually being considered for oil and gas development. It was chosen because this is an area that does have high potential for, for, for significant, significant accumulations of oil and gas. It's the best onshore prospect in the United States, probably in North America. The southern boundary, I want to be very clear, of the 1002 area is the Saddle Roadship Mountains. The areas south of that are simply not prospective for oil and gas. The million and a half acres is the only part of Anwar that has any oil and gas potential. Despite the congressional mandate to examine the 1002 area for its oil and gas potential, very little exploration has actually taken place. Only about 1,500 miles of two-dimensional or 2D seismic have been recorded in the 1002 area. These data were recorded in two winter seasons in 1984 and 1985. I was a member of the industry team that designed those seismic programs. The only well that's been drilled in 1002 is the Kektovik Inupiat Corporation number one well, which is always called the Kick Well. It was drilled over two seasons in 1985 and 1986. This well was drilled on private, on native land, by BP and Chevron, and the results of this well are highly confidential and have not been released. The small amount of data in the 1002 is in sharp contrast to the amount of exploration data that the state has, acquired, has been acquired on state lands between the Canning and the Colville Rivers to the west. The result of this exploration has been that oil discoveries that have provided about, today provide about 17 percent of our nation's domestic oil supply. Most of this area has also seen the application of 3D seismic data. And the difference, simply put, is 3D seismic data is what, what X-rays or the CAT scans, an X-ray two-dimensional data in the plane. 3D, like a CAT scan, it's a volume of data that can be rotated and sliced. It's provided a much better technology for oil and gas exploration. And the real benefit is that you will drill fewer wells. The success rate, formerly 10 or 20 percent, is now up to 40 and 50 percent. This is good for the company, sure, but it's good for the environment, too, because you drill fewer wells. We've talked about the numbers of barrels, potential oil, in the Anwar between 6 and 16 billion barrels with a mean of about 10 billion barrels. Um, that's using a, a recovery factor of about 37 percent. In my view, I mean, the U.S. GS, I think, did a very fine job in this report, but I think that that recovery factor is fairly conservative. The recovery rates in Prudhoe are approaching 65 percent. If, in fact, they could reach that kind of recovery rate in Anwar, the amount of oil that could actually be recovered from the refuge might be quite a bit higher than the 10.4 billion. I've, I've heard stories about that oil only uh, provides a six-month supply. I think it's a dishonest statement. Uh, Anwar, in the average case of 10 billion barrels of reserve, will produce a million barrels of oil a day for over 25 years. It will help offset our current 57 percent oil import rate. It will keep the Trans-Alaska Pipeline system running for many more years, thus encouraging additional investment in exploration and production in Alaska. 
TAPS is currently flowing at less than half of its 2.2 million barrels per day capacity and can easily accommodate production from Anwar. The pipeline infrastructure on the east side of the slope will continue to move closer to the coastal plain, thus making transportation to TAPS more viable and speed development. For the past 25 years, Alaska's oil has been important to both the people of Alaska and the nation as a whole. Currently, Alaska is supplying about 17 percent of our nation's oil, about one in six barrels, which is down from over 20 percent in, in, in recent years. But thanks to new technology and a continued commitment to explore and drill, that number will stay firm for about six more years before it begins to decline. The 1002 area has the potential to double the amount of oil Alaska is currently producing, thus decreasing our importance on oil, on oil imports. There are those who decry exploring drilling the coastal plain. One common cry is that Anwar is the last great wilderness. This ignores the fact that 92 percent of Anwar is already in protected status, which is wilderness and refuge, and that's not good enough for some. Some would prefer to ignore the congressional mandate to evaluate the 1002 area and simply lock it up as wilderness. While putting the 1002 into wilderness stat uh, status may placate those of that view, it does not remove the fact that people live there. The Inupid Eskimo people live in the village of Kaktovik on Border Island within the coastal plain, and they have lived in this area for centuries. This is their home, and they subsist and recreate on the land. The military has active and abandoned sites in the 1002 area. A political designation of the 1002 area's wilderness will not make it so. I'd like to thank the chairman and the committee for taking this time to discuss issues regarding the coastal plain of Anwar. The 1002 area has the highest potential for oil and gas resources in the United States. I firmly believe that sound science is the necessary foundation for implementing successful developments in the Arctic, both in the profitable extraction of our domestic petroleum reserves and the protection of our environment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank all the witnesses for their testimony. Did start with Ms. Sweeney. We know that the Central Arctic caribou herd population has increased from 5,000 to nearly 32,000 since oil development began in Prudhoe Bay. Two other caribou herds that come into contact with Prudhoe Bay development have increased in size as well. But listening to the opponents of this you'd think that these herds have, have declined. And then we have the porcupine caribou herd that uses Anwar and Canada's coastal plain. Unlike the caribou using Alaska's oil fields, its population has declined. And we're supposed to believe that this is normal. In fact, we've heard almost nothing about what happens to these caribou in Canada. Are you aware of anything in Canada, such as over-harvesting, that may be having a population level impact on the caribou porcupine caribou herd? I am aware. Uh, I'll move this over. The, to address your, your question, yes, I am aware. Um, what one needs to consider is the co coincidence of the Gwich'in Indian lobby on their Canadian government and how they effectively lobbied to have restrictions uh, on the Dempster Highway. Um, weakened so that they could actually hunt the porcupine caribou herd from the road. And uh, f for your information, the Dempster Highway runs um, right in the migration path of the porcupine caribou. And if they're being over harvested, the, the weakening of the restrictions coincide with the decline in the population by about a third. Uh, so if they're hunting caribou along the Dempster Highway, how are they going to make it to the coastal plain to calve? And it's important to note, Mr. Chairman, that uh, calving would take place in the summertime. And the North Slope Borough has the ability uh, to regulate when development can occur. And our people have been very vocal about restricting development in the summertime during the calving season. And uh, because we too depend on the resource. The Inupet people of the North Slope uh, depend on caribou for their daily sustenance as well. And that's not often heard in this debate. And there is no way that the people of Alaska would allow development to occur if that was threatened. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Clark, you state in your testimony that, quote, the Arctic Refuge Environmental Assessment written in 1987 concluded that oil development would have a major impact on the porcupine caribou herd. 
I'd like to give you an opportunity to review this statement and make any necessary corrections. I have a copy of that 1987 report, and it does not say that. The report says major effects on the porcupine caribou herd could result if the entire 1002 area were leased. And for your reference, that's on page 123. I believe that the implications that there is a big difference between would and could, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to correct that statement in your written testimony. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would be glad to re-review that. Um, I, I would like to state, however, that uh, certainly from my history with this committee, I, am, uh, I know that this committee is has a high regard for science and expectations of using good science in decision making. Um, I think that it is, I know that it is well documented that um, oil exploration, oil drilling, oil development would dramatically alter the landscape of the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Decades of research by the Fish and Wildlife Service, by the U.S. Geological Survey, by independent research, and as late as last week, the re report that was released by the uh, National Academy talks to the impacts that will occur from, from development. If we're going to rely on the 86 draft, which gave rise to the 87 final, and I'd be happy to provide for the record the kind of there's the differences between the 86 draft and the 87 final um, are well documented, Mr. Chairman, and I think bear review by this committee. Um, if, you're, if we're going to rely on that draft or the final, um, then we have to acknowledge that there are going to be major impacts to wildlife populations and the ecosystem, whether we're talking about caribou or musk oxen or migratory birds um, or lesser known species uh, of that tundra. We have to acknowledge that the ecosystem will be damaged. Ms. Clark, I don't, I believe that any time there is human activity, you change the landscape. I think that the question is, can we, in an environmentally sensitive manner, explore and possibly remove oil and gas resources from, from this area? I think that you present a, a somewhat of a false uh, argument that we have to choose between our environment and our economy. I don't necessarily believe that that, that is the case. I believe that we can, and in, and in an environmentally sensitive way, go in and explore these areas. But that is a big part of what, what this debate is. Um, unfortunately, my time has expired. I'm going to recognize Mr. Markey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, I just need a little bit of clarification. Maybe the panelists could help me. Maybe Mr. Van Tine could help me or others down there. On page 5 of the bill, <clears throat> starting on line 22, it says, in general, the Secretary, after consultation with the State of Alaska, the City of uh, Kaktovik, and the North Slope Borough, may designate up to a total of 45,000 acres of the coastal plain as a special area <clears throat> bottom of page six, uh, top of page six now, as a special area, if the secretary determines that the special area is of such unique character and interest so as to require special management and regulatory protection, the secretary shall designate as such a special area uh, the Sadlerovchik uh, 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 Spring area comprising approximately 4,000 acres as depicted on the map referred to in section two. Um, can you please explain to me, in your opinion, Mr. Van Time, what the relationship is between the 45, 40, uh, sorry, the uh, 45,000 acres and the 4,000 acres? Thank you, Representative Markey. I think the <coughs> view of the special areas within the 1.5 million acre coastal plain is best explained by an analogy to the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, which also uses as a management tool the special area concept. 
And on this map on, to my left, there is a picture of the North Slope and available fields. There is a crosshatch small point in, in the exact middle of the map that uh, is called the Teshekpuk Lake Special Area within the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. And Secretary Babbitt had set this area aside, it's almost 600,000 acres, and said you may not lease in most of this area because of its unique wildlife values. And that kind of protection is analogous to the 45,000 acre that may be done here. And it is also demonstrative of the depth of that protection. Because the Secretary Norton, who is here today, is going to be reconsidering very shortly whether that special area should not be open to full oil and gas leasing because she has the discretion to do so. The industry wants it and she is going to reconsider that in the coming months. That is exactly the problem with this provision of H.R. 39, Mr. Chairman and Representative Markey. This provision is discretionary. It is also quite small compared to the 1.5 million acres and the 4,000 acres of Saddler Ochet Springs demonstrates that as well. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Ms. Clark, the, uh, the argument that, you know, we hear is that uh, all of this uh, oil would be necessary. Would, would it not mostly go down into California, the oil, if, there, if it was discovered and then delivered? And would it not then go mostly into the gasoline tanks of SUVs since 50 percent of all the vehicles that are going out on the road every day now are every, now there's every car that's now going to a junkyard is more efficient than the car or SUV being purchased by a family in order to replace it. So we're going backwards technologically. Um, wouldn't it make more sense for us just to in, increase the fuel economy standards for vehicles if most of the soil would just go to California for more and more um, uh, SUVs that are going out on the street? Certainly, Congressman. I, I would agree with that statement. Uh, the, the challenge here or the problem here is that we're looking at one prong of this whole issue. We're, the one prong is we're thirsty and hungry for oil. Nobody debates that. Nobody debates that we are a highly oil dependent country and uh, we obviously need more to meet our increasing demands. What we're not, though, doing is debating and, and rolling our sleeves up and confronting the need for energy efficiency. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, higher fuel economies, um, better conservation technology. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking what some believe is an easy way out. Let's go drill a national wildlife refuge. Well, what about the almost 300 other national wildlife refuges in 44 states um, that have, according to USGS, oil um, potential? Uh, to violate the integrity of a national wildlife refuge, to violate the integrity of the national wildlife refuge system is very short-sighted and the damages are irretrievable and irrevocable. Instead, we need to really conserve, we need to confront the challenge and be visionary and look to the long term of what our obligations to this country are. Thank you. Thank you for your great testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, uh, I want to again thank the uh, panel for being here uh, at this hearing today. You know, the Chinese have a, a saying that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Uh, the next best time is today. And there are those of us who were around, of course, in 1979 uh, during the uh, oil situation who recognized that the next generation of energy production had not been invented yet uh, and that we were still so heavily reliant upon the old generation. And unfortunately, nobody's done anything about it since then. A lot of talk, a lot of inaction, and uh, at least this administration and I thank the chairman for having this hearing today are willing to discuss the situation because it's absolutely critical that we plant the seed of energy independence today. I have a question of Mr. Um, Boyd, if I could please. And that is, Mr. Boyd, there's only been one well drilled in Anwar and it was drilled on lands owned by the natives that they can't develop unless Congress opens Anwar. Is it true that you're one of just a few people who have seen the results of that well? And if 
If uh, you haven't seen it, uh, that's okay. If you have seen it, well, what did you see? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have seen the well. Uh, the well is confidential, and uh, I got to see the well as a result of an Alaska Supreme Court case when I was still at the state, and I can't uh, discuss the, the, uh, the well itself. Um, hmm, okay. So, I guess if you can't explain the well, indirectly, is it worth then going up and drilling? Mr. Chairman, again, without it, irrespective of, of the well, I mean, I've supported the opening of Anwar long before I ever saw that well. Uh, like I said in my earlier testimony, I've worked in the industry for quite a long time, since the middle 70s. And um, so I've been supportive of opening Anwar. Um, a well is a data point. And um, so I'll leave it at that. Well, I Mr. appreciate Boyd, this is, that's called directional legislative drilling for an answer. He, he was trying to come in another way in order to get the, the answer. <laughs> And I appreciate your answer because I think, you know, indirectly, it is the correct answer. And that is uh, those that have seen uh, perhaps the well have made the determination that you're willing to support uh, the continuation of those opportunities for others. And, and that means a lot. I think it should mean a lot to this policy because uh, you have firsthand uh, knowledge. And, uh, you know, I've been up on the North Slope. I, I look at the potential and say, I don't get why we're not there because I believe it could be done in an environmentally sound way. Um, Ms. Sweeney, I assume you're familiar with the study by the National Academy of Science. Uh, what is your comment regarding what this study has to say about the impacts on the health and lifestyle of Alaska Natives of the North Slope? I would have to disagree and dispute some of the findings in that report. Uh, my people have are taking the revenues generated from oil development to address the social ills uh, that we face and that we are um, taking the opportunity to champion our own causes to address our issues and um, the social ills that are referenced in that report uh, were there long before oil development. Oil development did not cause alcoholism or diabetes. Uh, they were there, and you can trace them back to the days of the uh, early commercial whalers from places like New Bedford, Massachusetts, or Nantucket. And it's important to look at, at the contributions that early whalers made to the indigenous population of Alaska's North Slope. So to, to imply that oil development um, has caused social ills to Alaska's North Slope people is simply incorrect. Do you, um, do the Eskimo people of the North Slope care less about their caribou and the environment than the Gwich'in do? No, that's, and I say that with such passion and emotion uh, because the environment is who we are as people. The land uh, represents our culture, the Inupiaq culture, and it's something that is it, it very, very important to um, just our healthy existence. Um, Mr. Boyd, why, why is Anwar important to geologists? Uh, I, having been uh, a failed geology major in college, I, I have a, a passion for geology. And, uh, uh, well, well, I came to the conclusion I did not want to have to get a doctorate and perhaps live in Iran. And so I uh, did the only smart thing and switched to political science. And here I am in Congress, so maybe I should have stuck with geology. Well, but Mr. Chairman, um, I, uh, I guess I went the other way around. I started as a geologist and wound up in government, so maybe it doesn't work either way. Um, but as a geologist and having worked the Anwar for quite, quite a long time, uh, both w with a company and with other with, and consulting for companies, um, and working in other places around the world, I've never seen geology more complicated than that in the Anwar. And it's interesting, sort of just to compare the two USGS reports, the one from 95 and the one from 98, and even there you can see how the USGS, I mean, and this was a huge study, both of them, and how they really have switched the oil around. They, they have just changed the way they, they, they think about Anwar. And I'm not saying I agree with every word in that report. But the discoveries that have been made on the North Slope, mostly based on, with, as a result of 3D seismic, uh, have shown different depositional patterns that, 
how, and how they might exist in the Anwar. And maybe I'm giving you too long an answer to your question. And the, the real answer is the geology is as complicated as any, is as fascinating as any I've ever seen. It cries out for 3D seismic. The, the data on around a six by four mile grid, and you can throw a lot of oil fields through the grid in that seismic data. And the, the, the people that I've actually led through the exercise of trying to do the interpretation of it uh, get pretty flaked out and probably would have flunked out of geology school too, right about in the middle of Anwar, in a place called the Hula Hula Low. Thank you. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Chairman, could I address this issue as well, Ms. Mr. Van Tine? Yes. It's, it's a, an important question. You I bet. apologize to Representative Pallone. There are two points I'd like to make. One is that the geology of the Arctic Refuge is quite different than the rest of the North Slope. And Mr. Boyd had said in his testimony today that there's a 65 percent recovery rate in Prudhoe Bay, and if we could reach that same amount in the coastal plain, it would be quite a lot more than has been estimated. I would just like to reference to the committee a letter that Secretary Norton wrote to the Senate on that exact issue in which she said that the USGS recovery factors for the Arctic Refuge are based on properties of the geology that uh, are present and thought to have potential to contain oil, and that these are fundamentally different from the reservoirs of Prudhoe Bay and Alpine. And that's what led the USGS to have a recovery factor that's half of the 65 percent that Mr. Boyd referenced. And the other point I'd like to make is that the seismic exploration of 3D, as the National Academy of Sciences said, is significantly greater than 2D. Uh, they say that expanded application of 3D technology in those areas that where it currently exists in the North Slope will increase the potential con for conflicts with the caribou there. And so it's not a simple question. The coastal plain is a special area, and these are considerations that I'd like the committee to be aware of. Thank you. I, I will recognize Mr. Pallone next, although, Mr. Boyd, I would like your response after. Um, well, maybe that will give you more time to think of your answer. Or is it okay if he? Okay, could you please uh, respond? Well, Mr. Chairman, again, um, I don't agree with Mr. Van Tine really on, on, on either point. I'm not, I'm not saying the Secretary is wrong or right. All I'm saying is I don't necessarily agree with everything that the USGS has said. And I think there are attributes or there are aspects of the geology of Prudhoe Bay that are present in, in the Arctic Refuge, and I think in the 1002 area rather. I think it's just, in any case, I think that you can improve the, the, uh, the recovery rates over time. I don't know what it might be like in five years. All I'm saying is if recovery rates can be made higher, then, then you can get more oil out of the ground. I don't know what the number is going to be. Maybe 37 percent is the right number. But I don't think it has to be the right number. And as to the seismic, um, I, I don't agree that, that, that the 3D seismic is, is inherently more, more damaging than 2D seismic. It's true that there's lots more trucks and things on the ground. I'd like to use the example if you had two identical lakes uh, and they're frozen and you skate a little bit on one lake, and you skate a lot on the other lake, play a hockey game on the other lake, and both lakes melt. What, where, where is the difference? I mean, and seismic takes place in the winter. Now, I will say that there have been some problems in the hillier terrain to the south. And the trouble has been in turning vehicles because they, it was called a skid turn. Just last week, I saw a pretty interesting presentation how they've now developed not only the balloon tires, but these, these more, these it's hard to, these tractor tread type things, very low pressure, that are articulated and can climb over the terrain. It, I believe the industry is trying very hard, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, to, to try to advance technology, to try to minimize the footprint in every way that they can. Uh, Mr. Markey, over the weekend, uh, or the night before last, I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Castro talking about his environmental problems, and he looked at us and, and Mr. Uh, uh, Delahunt, and he said, uh, I, I will point out to you, sir, that there are no cod in Cape Cod. Is that true? Some? <laughs> that was his response to us environmentally. I, I just hadn't heard that. Uh, it was interesting that he would know. It could well again. We have this crisis that a lot of the areas are fished out, and we're trying to strike a balance now. Hmm. Because if you go too far on one side, then you wind up without the, you know, without uh, any of those natural resources being left there. So clearly, he's paying attention to our political agenda, uh, Mr. Pallone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Boyd a question, but it's by reference to um, the discussion we had earlier with the Secretary. The Secretary said that the bill requires the removal of all facility structures and equipment and reclamation of all lands uh, adversely affected by oil exploration. And the NAS reports 
that oil companies have not set aside, um, you know, funds, I guess, for removing infrastructure in the North Slope, for example, where they estimate about $50 billion would be necessary uh, to restore, you know, to take this material out, to restore the tundra. Now, you, said, you mentioned in your testimony that you think that the statement that ANWR will yield only six months of oil is misleading. And you said, based on the current mean estimate of, of 10.4 billion barrels of technically recoverable oil from the, from the coastal plain. But again, you know, I want to get to this issue of economically recoverable. In other words, if you take in the cost of having to um, remove these structures and the equipment and, and basically um, you know, restoring the tundra, if you add those costs, which I guess so far haven't been done for the North Slope, but if you add that, those costs uh, with regard to, um, to uh, the coastal plain, as, as this bill presumably requires, um, how does that change? I mean, it's 10.4 billion is technically recoverable, but what's economically recoverable given that you'd have to do all those things? Because uh, that's what the bill says. Through the chair, uh, Congressman Pallone. Uh, the, the economics of oil will depend on, on many things. I mean, you can almost think of, if, if I can, I don't have a graph for you, but of sort of three kinds of oil. The oil that was in place, the oil that was deposited, it's called OOIP, the original oil in place. That's a big number, 35 billion barrels. Then you apply this recovery factor that we've been talking about, and then you get the technically recoverable. That's the 37 percent. That's when you get to the 6 and the 16, uh, and the 10.4 is the mean. Um, and again, as, as you shift the recovery factor, that curve would move back and forth, get bigger or smaller. At the bottom end of the spectrum is the economically recoverable, because then you have to consider things like costs. And what are the costs of getting the oil out of the ground? But it's generally speaking, in the report, it's based on what the price of oil is. And as the price of oil at today's price is the technically recoverable and the economically recoverable would be virtually the same. But yeah, have, you figured out, have you figured into that, um, you know, the, the cost of of uh, removing the infrastructure and the restoration of the tundra and the other things that are required in this bill, and, and hopefully so. Has Mr. that, does that take into consideration that? Mr. Chairman, I, through the chair, I don't know the answer to that, I guess, but uh, a company will certainly take it into its consideration in their bidding. I mean, if, if they see that they have costs, that, that something will cost something, they will bid less for property because nobody knows what the price of oil is going to be. So I believe that those kinds of things are built in. And I should say that on the state, there's a fundamental difference between the federal leases and the state leases. On state land, basically the land between the Canning and the Colville, or between NPRA and ANWR, if you like, um, the state has not taken a position on what the removal will be. Well, I guess my concern, I don't want to belab belabor the point because I'd like to ask another question. My, my concern is, that no, you know, no one's taking into consideration these uh, these extra costs. I mean, obviously, they haven't. It hasn't even been done on the North Slope, and I would fear that it wouldn't be done here as well, even though the bill says so. Let me ask um, Mr. Tyne a question. In your testimony, you say that almost all of the Arctic is presently available for oil and gas leasing. But can you expand on which parts are available and which parts are not? Mr. Chairman, Representative Pallone, I'd be happy to. And in fact, the map that's on the easel over here does that uh, illustratively. And if we start on the left side, it's the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. And this is an area that is managed by BLM under a 1976 law that gave them jurisdiction over that. And that area was intended to uh, be evaluated for its oil and gas potential as well as for special areas to protect wildlife. At the current time, the northeast corner of it is about 4.6 million acres. The Babbitt uh, Interior Department leased that uh, 4 million acres of that 4.6, protecting the Teshekpuk Lake Special Area, which is the cross-hatched area in the northern part there. To its left is the northwest planning area. That's about 9.8 million acres. The EIS for that is currently in circulation. The comments are due very shortly. To its left and slightly below is the south planning area, which is just over 9 million acres. That is slated for planning in 2004. Note that the cross-hatched area in the northern part of the NPRA, which was protected by Babbitt, Secretary Norton has now announced that she's going to revisit those 600,000 acres for drilling for oil. Offshore, the, the yellow area is the Beaufort Sea, 9.8 million acres. The final EIS just came out. Proposed notice of sale from the Minerals Management Service of the Department of Interior was just released last week. 
September of this year will be a lease sale of that 9.8 million acres. And finally, Mr. Chairman, Representative, that, that middle area between the Colville and the Canning, which is re mostly red on this map, is 14.1 million acres of state land. It is annually offered for lease to oil. And so you gases. only have a very small percentage. In other words, the Arctic Refuge is, is a very small percentage of the, of the Arctic that is protected from, from oil and gas leasing and development at this point. So what? Very true, Mr. Chairman, Representative Pallone. And you can see on the right side of this map, 5% of that coastal plain, where the high peak of the mountain out to the ocean, the one green part on this map is the only area that is currently off limits to exploration or development. Thank you. I don't know, do I still have time, Mr. Chairman, or we're out of time? Your, your time is OK, thank you. Mr. Markey, did you have any further questions? Yes, I, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, if I may, I'd like to uh, uh, pose a question to uh, Governor Murkowski's representative, Ms. Sweeney, down here. Um, the present law says that 90 percent of the revenues go to Alaska, 10 percent to the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, last year's bill that uh, passed changed that for ANWA to 50-50. Mm -hmm. And uh, the President's bill, which is up here before us now, the President's budget, maintains that 50-50 split. Has Governor Mikowski committed that he won't sue on behalf of Alaska to um, extract a 90 percent uh, return on the uh, uh, Arctic uh, oil revenues? Not to my recollection. I'm, I'm not aware of that. You're not aware if? He has pledged not to sue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you uh, can you tell us that he won't sue if we pass it and change it to 50-50? Well, we're here right now in support of Anwar. We're here because the bill is uh, in discussion, and I'm here to reaffirm our our support. Yeah. Well, the the, the I understand that, but Representative Young's bill is a the, is a 90-10 split again, and then it goes back to the present law. It doesn't reflect the president's budget, which assumes a much higher level of revenues mm -hmm. going to the federal government because he has a 50-50 split in it. Mm -hmm. So do you support the Young version or President Bush's version? We're not taking a position. You're not taking a position. And would you take a – and so you would reserve the right then to sue uh, to claim 90 percent. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we're not taking a position. And what, what I mean is we're here in support of responsible development of ANWR. No, we appreciate that. We're, I'm just, we, you know, a lot of what we do here is premised upon the need to add more revenues to the uh, federal budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're just trying to find wh uh, what our relationship with Alaska would be on this issue. In other words, would they accede to a 50-50 split on the uh, money from the uh, Arctic Refuge, even though historically uh, they had always received a 90-10 split uh, mm -hmm. on the North Slope. And, I'm, and I will restate we're not taking a position at this time. Okay. Uh, Mr. Van Tyne, what do you think? Mr. Chairman, Representative Markey, thank you. I have heard each of our congressional delegations speak vehemently on this issue in the past in the state of Alaska, saying that the 90-10 split is what is the deal in the Statehood Act, and we will fall on our swords to get it. And that uh, is, in effect, what a non-position that we hear from Ms. Sweeney now is, because the law is uncertain in this area, and what will happen if the bill passes as written is that in all likelihood the state of Alaska will go to court to get its 90 percent rather than the 50. And, and I apologize. It turns out Mr. Young's bill is actually silent on this issue, so I just want to correct the record and make sure that that is uh, clear. So the, uh, and, and that would mean that the current law would stay intact, the 90-10 language. 90-10, yes. And, uh, and I would be greatly concerned by that. Mr. Chairman, okay, for us to go through this whole effort and then have the revenues not flow into the federal treasury that would help us to balance the budget, you know, pay for the war, uh, pay for the homeland security. Um, thank you all so much again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm sure, Mr. Markey, that before this bill works its way all the way through this committee and the floor and through the Senate, that 
we'll have a pretty good idea of where we are. I do know that it's a concern and it has come up in the past. I, I would like to go back just in closing to, to Ms. Sweeney, if I can. And if, if this question was asked while I was out of the room, I apologize to you. But you talked in, in your or, oral testimony about being a, a native Alaskan and the impact on, on your town and in your area. And I have been to Barrow before. And the day that, or the couple of days that I was up there was a very nice place, but I understand it gets pretty cold the rest of the year. But why, why is there competing uh, opinions that, that we're hearing out of the, the native Alaskan community? Um, we're hearing that some people are opposed, some people are in favor. Can you clear that up? Sure, I'd be happy to. The local people of the North Slope, a vast majority, are in support of Anmar development. And there is a group of individuals who are not from the North Slope, they're not local to the region, and they live outside of Anmar uh, and are well over 100 miles away from the coastal plain who are opposed to Anmar development. Well, let, let me stop you right there because, and I may be mistaken, but in, in my recollection of the testimony that we've received today, they talked about um, this other group being in the in the North Slope, but, but you're telling us that they're not living there? That's correct. And from opponents of ANWR, uh, you will rarely hear the Inupiat viewpoint in this, and they will imply that the population of Gwich'in people are from the area or that this land is sacred to them or they call the area sacred. Uh, well, for the Inupiat people of the North Slope, we call it home. The, um, does your regional government, your uh, tribal government there, do, do you believe that they place a high value on, on protecting that environment? Do, they sure do. And it's, it's just a matter of who you are or who we are as Inupiat people. And our subsistence lifestyle and traditional cultural practices are, make up who we are as Inupiat people. And to consider that we would rubber stamp anything that came out of the industry is one, an insult to our intelligence and it's, intelligence and it's very offending. Uh, because we care about the environment, we care about the wildlife in the area, and we want to continue living our lives as Inupiat people, whatever that may be. But Anwar development provides us with the opportunity uh, to practice self-determination. Thank you. Um, Ms. Clark, if, if I could go back to you for just a second. Do, do you believe that it is possible to explore for for oil and, and remove oil in an, in an environmentally sensitive way? It almost sounds like a trick question, Mr. Chairman, so let me think about it. I, I would say that I believe, this, I'll have a circuitous answer, I believe strongly that the um, National Wildlife Refuge System Improvement Act is is, has standards and evaluation criteria by which all impacts in our National Wildlife Refuge System should be evaluated. Um, uh, I am not an oil development expert. Um, all I know is what I have heard from refuge biologists, USGS researchers, uh, what I've seen myself of oil development, and uh, I believe that this bill falls very short of any specific evaluation criteria or evaluation standards or aggressive um, uh, mitigation standards that would protect, per the scientists, protect the integrity of the coastal plain for the original purposes for which the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge was established. Have you made 
suggestions to the committee for what the, those protections would be? Have you offered uh, alternative language that would meet that criteria? I have not, Mr. Chairman. If if you would be willing to do that in the organization you, you now represent, I would like to see a proposal that you think would, would meet that, that criteria, whether it's coming out of you personally or um, out of uh, the organization you represent. I, I would be interested in seeing what, what you would, uh, would see as, as appropriate language uh, that would do that. I think it would be an interesting opportunity for the committee to have that. But I want to thank this panel of witnesses for your testimony and for the answers to the questions. Uh, again, there are members, because of our schedule here today, there are members who had questions that they wanted to ask of this panel uh, that unfortunately were not able to. Those questions will be submitted to you in writing. If you could answer those for the committee uh, within 10 days so that they can be uh, included in the, in the hearing record, it would be appreciated. But again, I want to thank you, for all of you, for your testimony and your patience in, with our schedule here today. So thank you all very much for your testimony. Mr. Chair? Yes. On behalf of the state of Alaska, I would like to formally invite this committee to conduct its field hearing in Kaktulvik so that the members have the opportunity to meet with local people in, in the region and to see what Kaktulvik is like and um, hopefully inform the committee on the impact that the decision to open ANMAR will make. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the invitation and we are intending on holding a field hearing in, in Alaska for that purpose and other purposes that come under the jurisdiction of, of this committee. But I do believe very strongly that the best way to educate and inform the members is to have them actually go see it and, and understand it. But I appreciate the invitation. I'd like to at this time include in the record a resolution from the Alaska Federation of Natives at their 1995 annual convention. I'd also like to include a statement from Oliver Levitt, who's the chairman of the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. And without objection, those will be included in the record at this point. There's no further business before the committee. I thank the witnesses. I thank the members of the audience for attending. And the committee is adjourned. Coming up, a hearing on prevention of child pornography and abductions. Then a look at U.S. military training for urban warfare.